Welcome, internet friends, to subscriber story time number nine. If I talk like that, you probably all just disowned me. Um, I've gotten several questions about whether you can submit fictional stories as true encounter slash subscriber type stories. I personally don't mind getting fictional stories, but I'd like to keep them in the style of true encounters, um, told like the ones you hear here, or in the style of no sleep or let's not meet type posts. And in the same realm, if you've written a story on no sleep or let's not meet and you would like me to read that, um, feel free to send that my way. I've gotten a few of those in the last couple weeks. Um, yeah, but I want them to stay in that sort of style just so it stays consistent. I know not everyone likes fictional stories that claim to be true, but um, I personally don't care. If it's a creepy story, it's a creepy story, right? We have seven subscriber submitted stories, so without further ado, turn out the lights and enjoy. My name is Robin Elizabeth, and I have a story relayed to me from my granddad about my great-great-grandfather, or his grandfather. When my great-great-grandfather, Thomas Jackson, was in his early twenties, he worked in the Pendlebury Colliery in Lancashire, England. At the time, mines were known for being dangerous, unhygienic places. Employers had little care for employee safety, so unfortunately, tragedies weren't uncommon in these sorts of places. Mines would often collapse, flood, or set on fire. There are many cases of a large number of miners being trapped and left to suffocate in the dark, cramped holes. Thomas worked in the mines for a majority of his life, even after this incident, as did most of the men in his family. On one particular night, he was working his shift in one of the tunnels when he heard someone call his name from the entrance. The first time he heard the voice, he dismissed it, thinking it was just his imagination, as he had been working down in the mines for several hours at that point. But he heard the voice again, for certain this time, shouting, Tom, from the entrance of that tunnel. So he left his tools and walked a fairly large distance over to the entrance of the mine, only to find there was nobody there. Understandably unnerved, but again, shaking it off as his imagination, Thomas returned to his work. But only a few minutes after he'd picked up his tools and begun to work, the voice came down the tunnels yet again. He now thought that one of his co-workers had returned to the mines to play some sort of practical joke on him, so he decided to just ignore the voice. But the voice wouldn't stop this time until Thomas reached the point that he had had enough. Once again, he threw down his tools and went to the entrance of the tunnels, stepping out of the mines. And again, nobody was there. But before he could open his mouth to tell whoever was out there to come out, he heard a noise behind him. The entire section that Thomas had been working that night had collapsed in on itself, sealing the entrance of the tunnel shut. It scares me to think what would have happened if Thomas had stayed in the mines, and that if it wasn't for that voice, I wouldn't be here right now. This is a note from me. Um, this next story is confirmed to be true, and I have expressed permission from the author to use it, and my regards and thoughts go out to her and her family. I guess I should start out with some backstory so you can fully understand how strange the whole situation is. I was born on November 2nd, one of the days of the celebration of the Day of the Dead. My mother, being a very religious woman, has told me my entire life that I am special because of my birthday and the fact that I was very adamant that I saw people that weren't there growing up. I had imaginary friends that resembled my guardian angels that one medium said I had. Eventually, I started leaning towards my father's view. I hated anything spiritual and would much rather understand the world with science. I ignored my mother's request to go see a psychic or a medium. I only went a few times when her nagging became too much. Each time, they would tell me that I had a lot of people on the other side and that I had a gift. I wrote that off as just them telling my mom what she wanted to hear. Although, I had been born late in my parents' life, and most of my extended family had died by the time I was ten. 
I forgot about it for a while, until I was 12. My father had been dying of cancer for a few years, but being that young, I didn't fully understand. He sent me to Europe on a school trip, when one night, I started thinking about how my dad always gave my brother more attention. I'd always felt like the black sheep of my family. I was too much like my mom to get along with my dad, and too much like my dad to get along with my mom. I didn't even realize I said it out loud till the girls I was sharing a room with asked me what I said. I realized that I had said that I wished my dad would die. Immediately, a feeling of guilt and dread washed over me. I prayed to whoever was listening to not take what I had said literally. The next day, I was in Switzerland, and I knew my father had died the moment it happened. I got dizzy and had to sit down that night when the phone call came. That alone can be explained. My father was sick most of my life, and he had been suffering for a while. Still, a month later, my brother was making fun of me for something I don't remember what, and I just had the thought, I want him to die. A week later, he flipped his car and died on impact. I thought it was over, but what I soon came to know is that all bad things happen in threes. My half-brother, Mitch, had always had trouble with substance abuse, but he was turning his life around. He was always so happy and would help anyone. That's why he was on the side of the road one day, helping a lady whose car had broken down. He was hit by a drunk driver. While I did not wish for Mitch to die, I did think, what if he did? I was never the most emotional kid and had issues with empathy. I merely thought, who was next? And Mitch popped into my head. I'm what you call baby-faced. I'm also short, around 4'11", and my sense of style isn't the most mature. I hardly ever go out without my teddy bear bag. I know, that's very childish of me, but the teddy bear bag means a lot to me. Because of all these reasons, I get mistaken for a little girl way too often. These details are important. So I live in Australia, and here, a majority of us are really friendly, so I hardly ever think of stranger danger. And one day, I was out shopping, and a man approached me. He got down to my level and gave me a smile. Hey, little girl. I noticed you came into the shop alone. Are you lost? He asked. I shook my head. No, nope, I'm not lost. Thanks for worrying, though. I replied and decided to leave. He felt a bit off to me. Soon after, I was walking around the shopping center, just browsing. By now, I had forgotten about the man and was just enjoying myself. Then I noticed him walk into a nearby shop. Got a little worried. However, I remained calm and decided to leave now. While I was walking towards the exit, I caught a few glimpses of him. I now definitely knew he was following me. However, I got home safely and thought that was the end of it. I was wrong. It was now nighttime, and I had been woken by my beloved cat. I assumed he just wanted to be let outside or fed, but when I got out of bed and turned on the lights, I noticed his pupils were wide. I knew that this was a sign of fear or anger. I assumed he was scared of something, so I grabbed the pocket knife I keep in my drawer. Midnight ran downstairs and I followed him. After I looked through the house, I felt silly for grabbing a pocket knife, but kept it on me. I went over to my cat and saw he was hissing at the back door. I turned on the porch light and saw something shift and hide. It was too dark to see what or who it was, but I assumed it was a cat, since midnight was popular with the local cats and they'd sometimes even come to the house. So I opened the door so midnight could go out, but he continued to hiss and back away from the door. And then I heard another shifting noise. I opened the door slightly and called out. If anyone's out there, you better get going. I was scared. You could even tell it in my voice. I caught a glimpse of the same man from the shop getting out from a bush and running away. I quickly called the police and informed them. 
Later on, I was informed he was caught and they searched his house and found some disturbing things. On his computer, there was child pornography and on his phone, they found photos of me in the shop where he talked to me. Since then, I've been wary of strangers, especially ones I have bad feelings about. My name is Riley, and I'm 23 years old, and I live in a small town in a big city. What I'm describing in this story took place two years ago when I was turning 21. It was around my 21st birthday. I was trying to get by, juggling two jobs, university, and managing my home. I lived out on the countryside, which was an hour and a half away from school and work. Driving back and forth from work and school and home was getting to be nothing more than an unneeded burden, so I had been searching for a few months to find somewhere closer to school that would be more practical. I came across a nice apartment complex which was cheap and fairly new, and before I knew it, I was moving in. I was very happy with my location. School was just 20 minutes away and work was also around the same distance. The process of moving in was difficult, as it usually was, but I tried to stay positive. I was damn tired constantly, however, from staying up so late unpacking. I figured if I stayed up later, the whole hoopla would be finished sooner and I could start normal daily life. A month passed and I still wasn't fully done packing, but it was much more comfortable than before. I was living happily and much more practically than ever. I began focusing on grades, and everything was going wonderfully. Why did it change so abruptly? It was a Thursday night. I was coming home from working the night shift at the diner I was working at during the time. It was a tiring day of people complaining about stupid things like putting too much ice in their coke. I was tired and ready to sleep. I walked inside the main door of my apartment, letting out a tired groan as I shut the door behind me and slung my bag on the ground and began to unbutton my coat. The apartment was quiet, as it usually was when I came home, but I liked it that way. The time was 10.04, I believe, or somewhere around that time, when I took off my shoes and set them by the door, walking deeper into my apartment. The lights were all off and nothing was suspicious. I wasn't ever, in a million years, expecting what was about to happen to happen to me. I walked into the kitchen and set my keys down on the bar top, opening my fridge when I thought I heard something coming from inside my bathroom, the only one in the apartment. I shook my head to the sound, however, not thinking anything of it, dismissing it to be neighbors. I was blessed to be the neighbor of those people the ones who were constantly fighting or doing something insane during the dumbest times of the night. So I proceeded to get out the leftover chicken from the night before, one of the only times I ever actually cooked something in that apartment. I put the chicken in the microwave and waited for it to cook, but then I heard the faucet running from inside the bathroom. I was now a little freaked out. The water seemed to stop as soon as it began, but I knew I heard it. I quickly stopped the microwave and, very quietly, snuck across the room to the cracked open door of the bathroom. The lights were off inside the room. It took all of my courage to put my hand on the door and push it open, and then turn on the light. And there it was. There, inside my bathroom sink, was a person. She was small and pale with a greenish tint like a corpse. She had drooping, dark eyes and long, dark hair that hung into the overflowing, steaming hot water she had her legs crossed in. Water was dripping over the counter and onto the floor as she looked at me with her terrible, gaping black eyes. She had green, purple, and red bruises on both of her kneecaps. They weren't any older than a day or two. She wasn't wearing any clothes, and the only thing she wore was a pair of white socks on her feet. We were both silent. I stared in complete shock, feeling sick to my stomach, and she stared back at me with huge, wide eyes. I shook my head hard, finally screaming. I swear I saw her move to come towards me as I bulleted out of my apartment with my keys and no shoes, 
I didn't return until the morning with my friend Alexander as I refused to go inside alone. And when we entered again, there was no girl in the sink any longer, but the floor was soaked in now freezing cold water. I moved out of that apartment to the other side of town where I share a house with my friend Marcy. That day, that girl, was the most terrifying experience I have ever had in my life. I have not seen her or anyone else in my sink since then, and I pray to God I never do. The story happened to me when I was young. Some might say it was my imagination as a young child, but this memory is chilling. My aunt used to watch me when my parents were at work. I loved hanging out with my cousins, mostly my older cousin, who was three years older than me. One day, I got to have a sleepover, which was amazing for me at the time. She slept in silence and pure darkness. I, on the other hand, needed some light, so she agreed to put a nightlight outside the door. It was bright and could be seen outside the door. Soon, after my cousin turned off the light, she was out cold. I was laying right next to her bed on the floor. If I reached up, I could touch her hand. I was that close. I felt uneasy and like someone was watching me. I was staring at the ceiling where the light was touching. I was tired, but I felt like if I fell asleep, something bad was going to happen. I tried to wake my cousin, but she was dead to the world. So I laid there counting sheep, trying to sleep. Then, Suddenly, I saw movement coming from outside the door. I sat up, trying to see if my little cousin, a year younger than me, was trying to sneak in, but saw nothing outside the door. I was scared to stand up and check fully, so I laid back down. I looked back at the ceiling where the light touched and was paralyzed with fear for a minute. There was a shadow puppet on the ceiling. Something was making a shadow puppet with the nightlight. Thinking back now on how it looked, it is almost impossible to manipulate your hand the way the shadow puppet was. It had two eyes spaced evenly apart and the mouth was fully extended fingers. I laid there staring at it for a while. It didn't move, not even a twitch. After a while of that, I heard a male voice right next to my left ear tell me, Go to sleep. You are safe. No one will hurt you. Over and over and over again. While the voice talked, the shadow puppet moved its mouth as if it was talking. This went on for what seemed like forever. It then started asking if I wanted a lullaby. I stayed silent because I feared what would happen if I said anything. Then, it began singing the lullaby my mom sang to me, You Are My Sunshine. When I didn't go to sleep, it started to repeat, Go to sleep. You are safe. No one will hurt you. But this time, the voice had an edge to it, like I was doing something wrong. Soon after that, I crashed from exhaustion. The next morning, I woke up later than I normally did. I felt so weak and tired, but I still wanted some water because my throat hurt. I went upstairs and asked my aunt for some water. She was doing dishes at the time, so she had her back to me, but grabbed a glass for me. Her sister, who was living with them at the time, asked, Did you have a bad dream last night? Because I heard you screaming. I looked up as my aunt turned around, and both of them stared at me in shock. My aunt and her sister rushed over to me. They were looking at my neck. I started to panic and asked, Why are you looking at me like that? They told me I had a handprint on my neck. It was a man's handprint. You could see each finger perfectly, including where the thumb overlapped the other fingers. I was strangled in my sleep, where the only person in the house who heard me scream was my aunt's sister. Her room was upstairs, across the house. Months later, I took a nap in my cousin's room. When I woke up and went upstairs, my aunt asked me if I had a nightmare because she heard me screaming. 
I told her no as I looked up at her. Once again, I had the same handprint around my throat. My aunt didn't let me nap downstairs again. That wasn't my last experience in that house, but after those experiences, I refused to sleep until the sun came up. My cousins and mother have told me some stories of their own. I could go on and tell each and every story, but that would be way too long. It was midnight in May 2013. I had graduated high school the previous year, but I still visited my old high school friends from time to time. I was driving two of them home from a theater or drama production celebration at Applebee's because they didn't have cars yet. Each friend lived in a different town, separated by one long, winding road. There isn't a way between these two towns except for this road, or the highway. The first friend lived right off of it, so I dropped her off and then turned onto the road to drive my second friend home. Pretty soon, I caught up to a red pickup truck in front of us. There was a tarp covering a motorcycle in the bed of the truck, covering a license plate. I didn't tailgate him, though he was going a bit slow, and kept driving. After a few miles, we got to the intersection that sort of connects the two towns. It's a very dangerous intersection. The lights only flicker instead of change. It leads to so many accidents. So at first, I wasn't surprised when the truck slowed down, but then it pulled over, stopping on the side of the road. I went around him to get to the light, and as I did, glanced over. It was a man in the truck, with bright blue, piercing eyes. He was bald, and he had this almost angry smile on his face. Still, I simply drove to the light and checked the intersection as I slowly pulled forward. Then my friend said, in a shaky voice, w What's he doing? I looked in my rearview mirror just to see the man get out of his truck, pull a ski mask over his head, and start running towards the car. I saw the glint of a huge knife in his hand. My friend and I screamed. He was moving so unnaturally fast. I sped away in the direction of my friend's house, but drove right past it. I could still see him in the rear view, his knife glinting in the moonlight. We drove around town for a half hour until I finally did drop my friend off. She lived right near the intersection though, so I wanted to be sure she got home safe. When I saw her walk inside, I sped away again, calling both my boyfriend and the police. Then, 15 minutes later, I got a phone call. He's outside my house. My friend told me he was standing there, knife by his side across the street, glaring up at her bedroom window. The police came just as he left, and never found anything. My friend group has some problems in their lives. A lot of these problems revolve around their families, and when they want to get out of the house, I'm the person that they go to. My house has essentially turned into a friend sanctuary by this point. We'll hang out and try to block everything out for most of the time, but for an hour or two, we'll have what we like to call deep talks. During the warmer seasons, we can climb onto the roof, or during winter and particularly cold fall nights, we would stay inside and light candles. Occasionally, we'd go up to the living room where there are two large windows that cover the back of the house. It's easier to look at the stars that way. Generally, I have a rule about how no one can come over or that I won't cancel my time at my mom's house unless it's a special occasion. This was one of those. I had spent most of the short winter break at my mom's house, but my two friends asked me to get out of the house. Their reasons were valid to me, and the next day at about 2 p.m., we left to pick them up. As usual, even though we were at a different house, we went downstairs and messed around for a few hours. One of my friends, who I'll call Alex, requested to go outside to the smoke porch for deep talks. Me and my other friend, who I'll be calling Holly, instantly agreed. We grabbed an ashtray, the incense matches Alex had brought, and a blanket before we left into the cold porch. 
After we lit a match, we started talking, but we were interrupted by the sound of the wind and a large smacking type sound as the door of the porch burst open. I would have assumed that it was the wind, but I always made sure to lock the door after I let my dog out. Holly decided that she had had enough of the porch for a while and went back inside. Alex and I decided that we couldn't have deep talks without one of the people in the group, and I stood up to close the door that was blown open. I made sure to lock both of the locks on the door, and I know that I did it well enough because I couldn't unlock one of the locks the next day until Alex came to help me. One small bit of context you should know is that all three of us are pretty spiritual people. Holly was raised a shaman, I have believed in the paranormal since I was nine, and Alex was quickly convinced about the existence of ghosts. I don't like to assume things are ghosts, because I know the more I try to debunk something, the more likely other people are to believe me when I say that it is a ghost. One larger bit of context you might want to know is that, where we're from, you can go ahead and toss the rule about dying in threes out the window, because people at our high school die in fives. This year, my older brother was killed. Two days later, a girl was shot. One girl committed suicide, one of Holly's friends was hit by a train, and another one of my friend's older brothers died as well. Last year, there was a family whose father committed murder-suicide. The fact that there might be a ghost hanging around one of us wouldn't surprise anyone in our friend group. We continued deep talks inside for a while before Alex wanted to burn more incense. We went out onto the porch again and lit up some of the short matches. We turned on some music and continued talking. The first thing that happened was that a truck drove by our group of houses slowly, as if it were looking for something. We could hear some distant rap music and bass coming from the car, and Holly made a joke about how her brother listened to that song that was playing. I heard the sound of crunching gravel. Alex assumed that it was just the road that they were driving on, but having driven past the road that the car had turned off of, and onto the road it turned onto, I knew there was no gravel on those roads. We continued talking. Holly burst up from her seat across from Alex and I, insisting on going inside. She said that she had seen the outline of a man and quickly slipped inside. Later, she told me that she didn't feel comfortable sitting on the side of the porch that Alex and I were on. Alex and I decided to brave the cold for longer, and while I was freezing, I decided to be a good host and stay out with them. Even after I saw a flick of darkness out of the corner of my eye, which I assumed was a shadow figure to save myself the effort of having to go get up and check, we heard fireworks, but at the time, I didn't know that fireworks echoed, and gunshots didn't. Based on what we had been talking about earlier, I assumed gunshots. Alex disagreed with me, it was close to New Year's, so people were probably testing their fireworks. I wasn't so sure, and I stood up to check the sky. It was a starless night, and while I could hear the fireworks, I couldn't see any colors bursting through the dark sky. I stood at the window for a second before I heard three footsteps. It sounded like they were stomping, and I could hear the stones crunching under the weight, coming towards me. I quickly took a large step away from the source of the sound, told Alex I was done and was going inside, then went inside. Alex followed soon after, but only because Holly and I were inside. When it was lighter outside, I walked out to the porch with my small dog in tow. Before I even attached her on the leash, I checked the stones that sat outside of the house. Sure enough, I could see three darker patches of water on the rocks from where I had heard the footsteps, and in the shape of a grown man's feet. Special thanks to Robin, Sarah, Creative Neko 22, Riley, Beautiful Chaos, Allie, and Z, sorry if I mispronounce any of your names, for sharing their stories with us today. If you've had a personal terrifying encounter you've had, it can be paranormal or not please feel free to send it to the subscriber story time at gmail.com and your experience might end up on the next subscriber story time. If you wish to stay anonymous, please mention that in your email. 
Thank you for listening to the end today, and if you liked the video, it would really help me out to leave a like and a comment down below. And if you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos from me. I don't know why I'm singing, sorry. Stay safe, friends. Have a good day, and also, have a good night.